just a little warning guys, this review may possibly contain spoilers pertaining to the game's cutscenes, story, and ending. So if you don't want to be spoiled on any of those aspects, then I suppose you should probably stop watching now. But if you don't care about spoilers, then I hope you enjoy the video. Hey guys, Triple G here, coming at you with yet another review. You guys have probably already seen me do several videos on it, including Let's Plays, Silly Moments, you've probably seen some videos of it on my friend's channel as well, and of course we are going to be talking about Dragon Ball Xenoverse. We have been playing this game quite a bit, and we always wanted to do a review for it, but I feel like if I want to do a game like this that really that I'm a big fan of the Dragon Ball universe, some of my close friends as well, I figured that it would just kind of not really get the point across if it was just me. So after going through the whole game and trying to unlock every single little thing we can, doing all the quests, I figured it was probably time that maybe I shouldn't just be the one reviewing this, but I figured I might need some help with this as well. Ah, speak of the Scourge. Alright, Colin, let's do this. So this is Dragon Ball Xenoverse, a 3D arena-styled cooperative action battle game developed by Dimps and marks the first game they've developed a fully 3D Dragon Ball game, being that their previous game lineup was the Budokai series and Burst Limit. Whereas this game features gameplay similar to that of the Tenkaichi series, and also appears to be borrowing some assets from last year's Dragon Ball Z Battle of Z, such as the Great Apes behaving similarly, the team-based gameplay, such as reviving a downed comrade, the combat and supers execution. Look, if you want to draw parallels with this game, go right ahead. Xenoverse was the brunt of that criticism way before its release, and people had the right to be worried. But hey, the developers of Budokai 3, the beloved Budokai 3, my first and favorite Dragon Ball game, are the working hands behind Xenoverse. Well, sounds good to me, but they did also develop this game and this game. Now, despite that we say this game brawls from Battle of Z, don't let that knowledge fall to your opinion of the game. I can tell you now for a fact that Xenoverse takes everything that made Battle of Z good and improves it, while fixing everything it did bad. While there's no spoilers in saying right now that this game isn't by any means perfect, it certainly bodes well for future releases. Firstly, let's start with one of the main reasons people were excited for this game. The storyline. While I've mentioned in my previous Scourge Reviews videos that Dragon Ball games' storylines can be very dull and samey, since they often just follow the storyline from the manga and anime, Xenoverse's selling point is that it offers a retelling of the Dragon Ball Z storyline, and that's primarily due to the nature of the game's villains. The story follows Future Trunks, now a member of the interdimensional police force, the Time Patrol, as he attempts to stop two rogue time travelers from the future, Toa and her husband, Mira, from stealing the energy of fighters throughout history and distorting space-time. Throughout the course of the story, more original characters are introduced, as such as the Supreme Kai of Time and Demigra, god of the demon realm. It's interesting to note that many of these characters and story elements, while many believe them to be new, have actually been adapted from another game, Dragon Ball Online an MMORPG that allowed you to create a custom Dragon Ball character, explore the world, and take part in all kinds of battles throughout time and space. Heck, even Akira Toriyama himself contributed to this game in the form of character designs and plot. Mira and Toa were this game's villains also, sporting the same scheme seen in Xenoverse, but with a few... <coughs> differences. 
Now, sadly, this game was never officially released outside of Japan and Korea, so most Western audiences are unfamiliar with the game and its events, so it's nice to see original characters like Mira and Toa get some love by introducing them to a wider audience overseas. Though, I could swear that there's someone that they forgot to include in Xenoverse. Hmm, must just be my imagination. Honestly, it's a shame that this game was never brought over to the US and Europe, and sadly all the servers for the game were discontinued in 2013. There are some dedicated fans working on porting the game in the form of Dragon Ball Online Server Revival Project on Dragon Ball Global, but more on that another time. We're here to talk about Xenoverse. Now I know we've strayed a little bit, but... What all this means for Xenoverse's story mode is that all the assets that make the Dragon Ball Z story what it is still there, by having villains that interfere with pivotal moments in the DBZ storyline, this can vastly change the characters and events, and suddenly, a story that we've all known the ins and outs of for many years becomes an entirely different beast altogether. Though most of these changes are usually fixed, and the outcome remains the same, this adds a new level of originality, while still remaining faithful to the source material. The in-game story is plentiful if you're a Dragon Ball fan like us. It includes events from the Saiyan Saga, the Namek and Frieza Sagas, the Cell Saga, the History of Trunks, the Boo Saga, events from Battle of Gods for the second time since Battle of Z, the Bardock and Broly movies for some inexplicable reason, and on top of that, there's add-on content for this game that features stories from Dragon Ball GT, which hasn't been seen in a Dragon Ball game for up to six to seven years. And for all those GT haters out there, don't worry. This doesn't make GT any less non-canon. GT is being written off as an alternate universe in this game, nothing more. Despite the fact that, as I've said many times, I actually like Dragon Ball GT, but moving on. Now you might be asking, so, where do you, the player, come into all this? Well, that's simple. You're the one who will be fixing the problems of DBZ history. Yes, you. That's right, just like Dragon Ball Online, and for the second time in DBZ game history, not counting that piece of shit hero mode that Ultimate Tenkaichi threw up. Blech. You are able to create your own custom playable avatar and play through the game's unique story mode with them. You can choose from up to five races. Earthling, Saiyan, Majin, Namekian, and Frieza Clansman. Like in the manga and anime, if you pick Namekian or Frieza clan, there is no selectable female base, as there are no females in their respective races, but there are for the other three races. Each race has unique stats, some have higher attack and lower defense, and vice versa, some have larger HP, some races key refills faster, some fire key blasts that stun momentarily, the list goes on. There are a variety of aesthetic customization options for each race, such as different colors, Body builds, hair, eyes, mouths, noses, you get the picture. Heck, you can even choose specific voices that you want from a list of those available. And hold up. Listen to male voice 8 for a second. <laughs> Sound familiar? Yeah, that's Takahata101, the voice of Nappa from TFS. Holy shit! The clothing items that are immediately available aren't anything to write at home about, sadly, as most of them are pretty basic and only serve to make you feel like that much more of a newbie. But don't worry, once you start powering through the game, more clothing items will become available, but more on that in a bit. As you progress through the game's story mode and complete various missions, your character will level up and gain attribute points which you can use to further develop your character by assigning them to things like power, key, stamina, supers, etc. The level cap started at 80 upon the game's release, but since DLC packs 1 and 2 have come out, it increased to 85, and there are some rumors that it will max out to around 100 by the end of DLC pack 3. How you level up your character is your choice. Some may decide that they want to focus more on long-range key attacks and therefore upgrade their key and supers, while others may decide that they want to be more up-close and personal in fights, and in such, add all their attribute points to stamina and attack power. When it comes down to it, the changes are very minor, and most of the fights will play out the same no matter the stats. But hey, at least it's nice that the option is there. Really, this just serves to prove that there is a lot more diversity in the game's mechanics, and you need to make sure whichever race you choose matches your playstyle. And think hard, because once you've chosen your race, that's who you'll be stuck with until you've beat the game. Yeah. No going back. You can't even create a secondary character as the game only lets you make more than one character after the story is complete. The only hope you'd have is going into your game data, erasing the game's save, 
and starting the game over from scratch. Things like hair and facial features remain fixed once saved too, but thankfully they can be changed in-game if you collect all seven Dragon Balls and summon Shenron. <sighs> so let's get into what really matters, what really defines a Dragon Ball game. The gameplay. You'll be doing one of two things in this game. Exploring the hub, known as Toki Toki City, or taking part in battles. Firstly, the hub. Exploring the hub lets you buy items and clothes, talk to NPCs, and so on. Toki Toki is a welcome addition to this game, as Dragon Ball games in the past have never really had a designated hub world in between fights. Apart from those small exploration areas in Tenkaichi 2 and the sky in Budokai 3. So it offers a nice little breakaway from the action in between battles, allowing you to check stats, rearrange items and equipment, and generally just take a breather. The aesthetic design of the city is also quite nice. The locale, the giant hourglass in the city center, and seeing all the custom characters walking around the place is a lot of fun too. The hub itself is quite expansive too. In fact, it's been stated that this game offers the largest online world in Dragon Ball history. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? The largest online world in Dragon Ball history! One more time? The largest online- Bitch! As we said, you're also able to purchase clothes and accessories from shops looted around Toki Toki using in-game currency, or Zenny, which you acquire from completing various missions in the game. A lot of these clothing items are nice little nods and references to other characters that didn't make an appearance in the game. Man, if there's one thing the time patrollers love to do, it's accessorize. That's it, work it, honey, work it. You're an animal, oh! Oh, that's it, give me a twirl. Brilliant, brilliant, oh! You're a tiger, oh! Hmm, seems like something's missing here. Oh yeah. How about the fact that I can't fucking see what I'm buying? How am I meant to accurately gauge if I want this clothing item or not without some kind of preview window showing me what it is? I mean, these might look like shit on my character, and I won't actually know until I've bought them! Wow. There's a lot of stuff I can buy on here. So many choices. Hmm. Wild Rider Suit. Hmm. What the hell is that? I wish I could see what it looks like. Oh well, I guess I'm gonna have to exit out and Google what it looks like. Why couldn't you guys just put this in the game? But with all that aside, the whole core of this game comes down to one aspect, the battles. And it's what you'll be doing 90% of the time. The fighting mechanics themselves are pretty bare bones and suddenly don't offer a whole lot of variety. You only have light attack, heavy attack, key blast, and block buttons. Chaining the light and heavy attacks together in particular succession could pull off some cool combos, but the list is pretty limited. There's sadly no separate mid to heavy punch and kick buttons, no technicals or advancing guards. There are things like kickback moves, guard breakers, and grabs, but even with these, once most players find a combination they like, they usually just stick with it and most cross-ups usually turn into a button mash. I know this is a MOBA in its purest form, but it would have been nice to see a few 2D fighter elements mixed in to flavor things up a bit. By holding the right trigger, or R2 depending on what you're playing this on, you can open up a list of your character's supers. These aren't really damage-heavy attacks, and really only serve to get some ground in between you and your opponent. And by holding down the left trigger along with the right, you can open up the Ultimates menu. These are powerful finishing moves that can deal substantial damage to your enemy if used properly. Once activated, these moves have a bit of a wind-up before firing, so timing and planning is everything. That final flash probably ain't gonna hit that guy from halfway across the map, but if he's rushing you from a distance, you might have a window of opportunity to rear it up and fire by the time he gets up in your face. Of course, by doing that, you also run the risk of having him break your guard and cancel the ultimate. Or in some cases, the ultimate just going right through him, despite him being right in front of you. Now, when it comes to fighting, you have a bit of variety to go about how you do it. Firstly, there's the story mode, as you'd expect. Secondly, there are these, what I can only describe as side missions, known as parallel quests, or PQs. Parallel quests are how a large number of unique clothing and special items, as well as special attacks and ultimates, end up being obtained. They are entirely straightforward. You and everyone else work towards the main goal of the mission, which differs depending on what it is. There are basically three varieties. 
beat all enemies in a lot of time, while defending another NPC from being KO'd, and finally, collect the Dragon Balls scattered throughout the map while beating enemies. Note that collecting the Dragon Balls in this mission does not mean you can keep them. Damn. You do have a much needed option to tackle these missions PvE style, online with the help of friends or even complete strangers. I can tell you now, I've had more fun and unlocked more items and abilities playing online co-op than I ever have offline. That's one shining recommendation I give this game. Play with friends. It's so much more rewarding and enjoyable. I tell you, the things you can accomplish online with a team of friends is astounding, even at low levels. At one time, me and Josh had barely cleared the Boo Saga, but when we teamed up online, we were taken on the likes of Beerus and Whis, something we never could have done alone. Another vastly important aspect of Parallel Quest is that some of them have hidden conditions for unlocking special events to trigger an ultimate finish. For example, you might have to beat a certain character before another character, or beat a certain character in under 5 minutes for instance, Otherwise, a special event won't even trigger, which may lock you out of a certain school and lock reward. Pew queuing can be done any number of times, however, and there are a few reasons to do so, whether it be raking up or farming for items and skills. Yes, sadly, everything you can receive from a parallel quest is based on a roll of the dice. On one hand, this gives the quest some replayability, and on the other hand, you might find this frustrating when you really want a certain skill or clothing item and find yourself farming the quest for hours on end without it dropping because you were unlucky. It didn't bother us too much as people who play a lot of RPGs and roguelikes, but I can certainly see how it could get on a person's nerves. So on one hand, I commend the developers for trying to add more replayability to the game through RNG aspects and special events, but... This can also cause frustration through repetition for those who dislike the thought of farming. You know what I dislike the thought of? Finishing the PQ, spawning at the starting area, and having to run all the way back to the parallel quest desk with the most slowest maximum running speed I've ever seen in a game. Hey dimps, it's called a Run button. I think people complain about Link's running speed and Orcarina of Time and having to constantly run across Hyrule Field as a child, but, but this! Look at this shit! Where is he at? Oh yeah, he's back at the uh, time patrol area. Where's that at? Let's see. Mother! Was it really necessary to make your custom characters this damn slow? In missions and battles, they tear it up, but in the hub world, it looks like they're going for a leisurely jog. Now granted, this spawning issue has been fixed in the latest update. Now you spawn in the tube just down the stairs from the starting point. What the fuck? Couldn't they have just spawned you at the place you initiated the quest from? At the desk? Now on another topic. While we mentioned that there's a great co-op PvE, there are also a number of PvP options available as well, including 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3 player matches, 1v1 ranked matches, and endless battle, which is similar to any console fighting game player lobby system, where two players fight and everyone else in the room, up to six players total, spectate. Oh, and there is also, as of this review, an unreleased world tournament mode. Unfortunately, all of these are easily the weakest aspect of the game for me. We'll put it simply. PvP is 
broken. Even after bug fixes to some of the worst offenders, playing PvP in this game is rarely satisfying, in part due to the flexibility of CAC, letting you mix and match the strongest skills, and in part due to some questionable design choices for some skills in Z-Souls. Z-Souls, in short, are special ability items, basically. In some respects, due to the way these function, if you want to PvP, you may be required to use specific skills if you want to be able to play at all. We'll give you an example. Super Saiyan. In this game, transforming into a Super Saiyan lets you use all super and ultimate attacks that cost key for free. Normally, these cost 1 and 3 key bars respectively. The downside is that Super Saiyan will slowly but constantly drain your key while active, but during this time you'll be able to fire off some way more ultimate attacks than you could have otherwise. So if someone goes Super Saiyan and starts spamming an ultimate with a Z Soul that gives an anti-attack flinch super armor equipped, you are going to die quickly and there are some powerful setups you really can't do anything about. Honestly, it's a crying shame that the PvP matches have fallen to these flaws. Since one of the things I was most excited for leading up to Xenoverse's release was the idea of battling against other players online. To be fair, these issues could be patched, and from what I'm aware, some have been, but that's the state of the game right now. You know, I'll admit, when you do find an opponent who doesn't use a win button strategy, which is rare, it can be pretty fun. Incidentally, the gripes I have with the online setup all mean nothing when you dive into the Time Patrol. Time Patrol is this game's stories mode. It usually consists of you being summoned to the Time Vault by Trunks in the Supreme Kai of Time to do of some big crisis in history. Now, we won't go into this into too much detail since we already covered the basis of the Time Patrol earlier in this review, but it hits all of the key arcs and has some unique twists to boot. I'd easily say that this offers one of the most faithful and accurate representations of the Dragon Ball story I've ever seen in a Dragon Ball game. And I don't mean in the actual story department, because as we've said, the DBZ story is something we all already know. No, what I mean is that it's faithful in its cutscenes. Most Dragon Ball games have never really put much effort into how they deliver the story through visuals, apart from a few CGs in Infinite World and Burst Limit that, though short, were fantastic, and they just made me want to see more of that. Thankfully, Xenoverse does just that. Each and every cutscene is sharp and fluently animated, offering recreations of exact scenes and movements from the anime that and the overall graphical style of the game complements to the DBZ universe quite well. It's no masterpiece, but it works. And this all serves to add an even higher level of satisfaction to see your character there in the cutscene too. Although what the fuck is up with some of the English dub for this game? It seems to fluctuate wildly between being too loud or too quiet in certain scenes. Other times the lines sound completely misread. Thanks for helping, Pan. Thanks for helping, Pan. Not only that, but sometimes the dub just flat out fucks up. In fact, the same can be said about the music, which often seems to be overpowered by the sound effects and dialogue. It's a shame since all the music in this game is all very Dragon Ball-esque, fitting and generally gets you pumped in some cases. It's nice to finally see some original compositions instead of rehashes from the Raging Blast games. Thank god that trend is finally broken. Although, what happened to that awesome theme song played in the trailers? Why'd that get the axe? Instead, for the opening, we got... Ugh. Chala again. Jeez, guys, stop overusing it, it's gonna get old. Now, back to the story. Though fantastic and a blast to play through, it does unfortunately seem to be heavily condensed. And what I mean by that is that it skips a lot of very important parts from the original story. I'm all up for changing things up a bit, but when you start deliberately missing out chunks of the storyline, that's where I draw the line. It doesn't do it much at first, apart from skipping the entire Android saga and jumping to the Cell games. But once you get up to the Boo saga, that's where it goes a little off. And it starts out with so much promise, too. But by the time you get up to the battle between Gotenks and Super Boo, it cuts out Gotenks going Super Saiyan 3 and skips straight to Ultimate Gohan arriving to help. But then, 
it takes it a step worse because then it skips right over Boo absorbing Gotenks and Gohan, right over Goku and Vegeta's fusion to Vegito, and jumps straight to the final battle against Kid Boo on Supreme Kai's planet. Seriously, look at this. Gohan is midway through fighting Super Boo. Super Boo then, under the influence of the game's villains, transforms into Kid Boo. After a bit more fighting, Kid Boo says, fuck this, and destroys Earth. And the next scene, Goku and Vegeta are miraculously on the Kai's world? Sure, sure, Trunks stated they arrived just in time to save everyone, but if that's the case, then why is Gohan not there? He was alive in the last scene, he wasn't absorbed. Oh what, was he caught in the blast or something? And come to think of it, why is Hercule there? He was nowhere to be seen through this entire saga. And on top of that, Majin Buu, aka Fat Buu, is also absent from the Kai's world, which contradicts the manga and anime. And if I recall correctly, Goku and Vegeta pulled Fat Buu out of Super Buu's body, causing him to revert to his Kid Buu state, right? And in this game, Super Buu transforms directly into Kid Buu for no reason. So, the only conclusion I can seem to draw from this is that somehow the game's villains removed or destroyed the Fat Buu within Buu's body, causing him to prematurely enter his Kid Buu form. So, we're trying to fix the DBZ history, right? Then, doesn't that mean that Fat Buu is dead? He wouldn't have to be revived in the wishes to restore Earth and its inhabitants, and the final went to Goku, not to mention the only fucker who would have really wanted him back would be Hercule, no one else gave a shit. Wow. Way to preserve history there, guys. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why they got so lazy with the Boo Saga. Thank goodness they clean up their act by the time the Battle of God Saga starts up, which is a damn near perfect copy of the film's story, and should be, considering that this marks the first time the Battle of God story has been adapted in a Dragon Ball game. Oddly enough, besides all the story issues in the Boo Saga, there's actually another really rather annoying problem with this game, but it started to rear its ugly head somewhere in the Saiyan Saga during a battle with a flurry of Cybermen, and that problem is that the game loves to constantly decorate its story with these ridiculous gauntlets, where it's just you versus a crap ton of enemies. Mind you, you do get the help of an NPC in these missions later on, and take the Super Saiyan 3 Goku vs Majin Buu mission for instance, but even in that mission, once the initial wave is dealt with, the difficulty spikes, and suddenly you're fighting six or more boos at once, and because the friendly AI is absolute garbage, they'll get KO'd in a matter of seconds, leaving you on your own to deal with it, with no way of reviving your teammates like in parallel quests. That on top of cheap tactics like spamming key blasts to lock you in place, it won't be long before tempers rise. And to make matters worse, there isn't any kind of co-op feature for the story mode. None! So either way, you're going to be facing these missions solo, whether you like it or not. Honestly, it just confuses me why Dimps didn't think to add this as a feature. Were they afraid that it would make the game too easy? Respectfully, that could have been a possibility, considering what I mentioned earlier about teaming up online. But then just up the difficulty online. Guys, come on! Honestly, I would have remained far more sane and composed of some of these missions if I had a friend to help me along, especially with that final boss fight. Ugh, fuck that! Regardless of these nitpicks, the Time Patrol story mode is still a fun ride, and the same can be said about the rest of the game too. It's a well thought out, addicting, and fun game that may have been received a bit more hype than the game could deliver on. While it does get a bit repetitive after a while, it more than makes up for it with its co-op online features, plethora of customization options, and DLC content that'll keep things fresh for a bit longer. DLC Pack 3 in a few days, guys. Golden Freezer. And Super Saiyan God Super Saiyan Goku and Vegeta. God, that name sucks dick. In terms of the game's success in the market, Dragon Ball Xenoverse has sold over 2 million copies as of April 2015 onward. I bet that's good news for the developers, and it's great seeing a Dragon Ball game finally hit the mark for the first time in years. Now let's just hope for a Xenoverse 2 sometime in the near future. Perhaps this time with more characters and time patrols? Heck, include some of the movies next time. It seems like such a missed opportunity. Characters like Janemba, Kula, and Hirudagon? Or would have fit great in this game? Why is Broly the only one who gets a pass? Now, whether or not to recommend this game is rather difficult, because it depends on what you're looking for. If you just want an action-packed romp through childhood nostalgia, Dragon Ball Xenoverse will serve you well. Ultimately, this game is competent and you can get many hours of enjoyment out of it, 
but it does have some noticeable flaws that a dirty game with a lot of potential. But if you're a DBZ fan, don't mind RNG lockables and either don't care about PvP or I'll kick off ridiculous matches that go on within it. This is a good, but flawed game. As for a rating? Although I don't often do ratings, I'll make an exception this one time. Me and Josh give Dragon Ball Xenoverse a 7.5 out of 10. Don't play around with key. It's hot. Ah. <sighs>